Hello, my name is Denzel Ribeiro. I am a program manager in the Azure Data team. Welcome to the DPS conference. I hope you're having a good conference so far. Today we are going to look at um, the Azure SQL Hyperscale tier and a deep dive into the architecture. Hyperscale is the future when it comes to um, Azure SQL database um, and this architecture will enable a set of scenarios that we couldn't do before. Uh, so let's dig into the agenda. The first thing we'll cover is some of the benefits of hyperscale. Um, then we'll look at the hyperscale architecture. We'll look at scaling, horizontally scaling, uh, which is possible due to separation of storage compute and some best practices and um, migration. So uh, first but not the least, what is Hyperscale? Hyperscale is a cloud native solution from an RDBMS perspective using SQL Server that solves a lot of the VLDB challenges that existed before. Um, it is an attractive platform for databases of any size, not just VLDB. Sometimes customers look at um, the storage benefit in terms of having the size capabilities of up to 100 terabytes as being the only reason to go to hyperscale, but there are benefits even beyond that. The separation of compute and storage enables uh, rapid scale up and scale down. So if you have periods you're not using the database, scaling up and um, down is a constant time operation irrespective of size. Um, separation also gives us a snapshot-based uh, backup and restore um, functionality. And, and again, that's in restoring a 20 or 30 terabyte um, database is usually challenging. That's not the case with hyperscale. Certain operations such as checkpoints are uh, and backups are offloaded off your main compute that results in potentially requiring a smaller tier for compute. And then we have read scale out capabilities where we can scale out up to four replicas. Um, and HA and failover time is a matter of um, you know, seconds, um, you know, less than a minute to failover from primary uh, to secondary. It's on par with the premium or business critical tier. From a performance perspective, um, the performance is generally better than the general purpose uh, or standard tiers in the Azure SQL DB uh, you know, family. Uh, there are still some uh, workloads which require very low latency on commits. And we are talking about latency, not throughput, which may be better suited to business critical at this point of time because log commit on hyperscale is on a remote SSD. Um, the separation of storage of compute also enables us uh, higher uh, data ingestion rate and the data ingestion rate is decoupled from the compute size um, and that's unique to hyperscale. And then from a size perspective, we enable uh, up to 100 terabyte uh, databases and uh, you don't have to worry about choosing a size, storage and log auto scales based on usage. Um, having said that, a number of workloads can benefit from this. Uh, it could be for OLTP databases of any size. Uh, you can have real-time type analytics where you are, um, you know, scenarios that have uh, non-clustered column stores on top of, um, you know, B trees. Uh, scenarios where you can ingest on the primary and read on the replicas, because you can scale out laterally. It also works uh, out for operational data stores, um, SMP data warehouses, where you would have them on a single node of SQL Server, and um, you know data ingestion at scale for things like IoTs, logs, and other applications. Next, let's uh, deep dive into the architecture. We'll look at uh, different components of hyperscale um, architecture. So if we broadly break down hyperscale, um, there are three main components of hyperscale. Um, one is the compute, all interaction of users, uh, whether it's read-write workloads or read-only um, you know, uh, access to replicas, uh, work with your compute node. And compute node doesn't have any of the data, so it's stateless. It has a local SSD cache. Then you have um, a storage layer called page servers, Page servers are remote to the compute and everything below this line 
uh, is not what the user provisions, it's what uh, system provisions behind the scenes. So you have a bunch of page servers that partition out data. Um, each of these page servers is a covering cache that has uh, local SSD. And then they are backed by more of a long-term storage or a persistent storage, which is Azure storage. These page servers, um, while they have a full local SSD cache, the, the actual data is stored on um, you know, Azure storage long-term. And last but not the least, you have a log service. So all your writes go to the log service, and it's the log service's responsibility to distribute them to other components within the system. So if we double click a little um, you know, further, uh, you have the primary compute we talked about where all users connect, all read write workloads or write workloads have to go to the primary at this point of time. Uh, and in this diagram, the red lines indicate the log pathways, the green um, lines indicate the data pathways. So all your writes are effectively to the log service. And this log service resides on a remote uh, node and it's backed by, and we'll look at some details, but it's backed by um, premium storage or Azure premium storage, which are remote SSDs. Um, then you have this log service sending all these log changes to the paid server, which is the storage tier. Each paid server has a replica. And each page server is responsible for 128 gigs uh, of data. So if you have a hyperscale database, the first page server would contain 128 gigs, the second 128 gigs, so on and so forth. So there are n number of page servers. Each of them have a replica. And then each of these page servers has a corresponding file um, of the same 128 gig size on Azure storage. Um, and that's your persistent layer of storage. So even if page servers go down, we have to spin up or patch or, um, you know, the long-term storage is Azure storage. And then the log service also, since this log service um, is a stateless service, it actually for restore uh, or, or pitter retention period, it will offload this log to a blob storage um, for the longer term log. Um, the log service also is responsible of then sending all these changes to one to four read replicas that you can configure today. There is redundancy at all tiers, as you can see. Page service has redundancy. Azure storage has built in re redundancy, whether it's um, REGRS for, for um, you know, re restore cross-region. Um, then all the, all the actual... Um, you know, communications happen via RBIO. So, uh, so when when uh, if you think of a standalone SQL Server, when we do a write, um, the write is actually uh, calls the OS write file. Instead of that, we use this RBIO protocol, uh, which intercepts that IO and actually sends it to the log service. So, similarly, all these communications are via RBIO. Uh, and then the failover between primary doesn't talk to secondary at all. Failover is using service fabric applications. Uh, you know, so service fabric takes care of the availability of paid servers and, rep, uh, and, and uh, compute replicas as well. So next, let's look at the transaction log hardening in a little more detail. The same log hardening rules uh, as SQL Server applies. So you have the standard SQL Server stack. So these are running SQL Server.exe. So you have the log writer. So when you do a, a commit, uh, the session doing the commit hands over that a log flush to the log writer and the log writer, um, you know, then will write that blog, uh, that block, um, log block to via RBIO to the log service. Um, right, and then paid servers and all these other components actually pull those log blocks or request for those log blocks from the log service, um, right? And this log service um, has a process called destaging, which actually, um, as these VLFs fill up, so these are VLFs, um, they are destaged to, to long-term storage and log is, um, you know, actually hardened to long-term storage as well. 
So a uh, couple things which are unique, uh, the VLFs or virtual log files um, are a fixed size on hyperscale. They're 16 gigs in chunk. The log service also has um, you know, some layers of caching, which we'll uh, look at uh, a little later. Uh, this landing zone, which the commit, the commit, all it has to do is actually write to this landing zone. It doesn't actually have to distribute the log anywhere else. Once it's written to this landing zone, uh, the log is hardened. This landing zone is uh, Azure Premium Storage, which is remote SSD. Uh, and then last but not the least, there's this long-term retention, we, we, which we talked about, which is for your point-in-time restore. So by default, you have seven days restore. Um, and, and soon we'll be lifting that to 35 days, um, you know, configurable restore time. So what is the log service? Let's look at details within that log service block. Um, the log service is a single producer, in other words, a single writer and multiple consumers or re uh, readers. The, the log writer component is the same in SQL Server. Landing zone we talked about is premium storage. And there's this X log process. So the commit actually, all it does is commits into the landing zone, that's it. And then the transaction is committed. This RBIO protocol, you know, since this is a, a file on Azure storage, we use something called XFCB or XStore FCB. This is the same as if you if you think in back in 2014, we introduced uh, databases with files on Azure storage, where we could um, create a file with a SAS token on Azure storage and the compute node or SQL server could talk to those files. That's this XStore FCB protocol. Um, you know, so LogFlush um, follows the same, you know, wall protocols or right ahead logging protocols, flushes the log block once it's, um, you know, committed or once it's uh, persisted in the landing zone, commit is done. Asynchronously, as VLFs are, um, you know, filled, they are destaged to this long term storage, right? Alongside um, this commit, asynchronously, the compute will send this log block to this X log process. And the reason why we do this is faster to send this over the wire than the log service actually having to read this from um, Azure Premium Storage. So this is asynchronous. So your commit doesn't depend on this block reaching. Um, right, so uh, the log blocks are sent to this X log process. There is something called a staging area. Um, so it's received into the staging area, and then these blocks are migrated into a hash map, which is called your broker. And this log broker actually, most of your requests from other components when they request for a log come from this log broker. So we will know if a log block, um, you know, we can apply filters to that to see, send filtered records to the page servers that they belong to. Uh, rather than sending all the log blocks to all components, this minimizes network traffic between um, you know the components. Um, this uh, so this uh, broker is only a few gigs in size, and then this is destaged to a local SSD cache. So there are multiple caching layers in all components, right? So it's fastest to read from broker. If not, it's next next fastest is to read from the SSD cache. If it's not in the SSD cache, it goes to premium storage. Um, right, and then page servers and secondary compute actually ask the uh, read the log blocks from the log service. They ask them for, hey, ha do you have a log block for me? And if so, it sends those um, filtered log blocks to the right um, components. Last but not the least, from the um, you know log um, perspective, we have something called a throttling service. Um, this throttling services sits on the compute node. Before we actually get to that, um, every tier in Azure SQL DB has a log generation limit. Um, the reason why is so that we can, um, you know, effectively ship that log to secondaries and maintain some of the SLAs required, um, you know, and RTO, RPO objectives required. So for hyperscale, irrespective of the compute size, your log generation uh, limit is uh, 100 Mbps. So anything over 100 Mbps will get throttled. 
in addition to that there is this throttling service that runs on your main compute node and the throttling service is actually uh, responsible um, for throttling log generation rate if some of the other components of hyperscale um, are behind and have not caught up um, and we'll see some of these details when we um, you know talk about paid servers because paid servers actually are um, you know a, a good chunk of the other external components so what this compute node does is it talks to the log service and gets the progress and the progress of each of these components as to where how far along they are with regards to application of the log have you applied a particular set of LSNs or not and so it gets this progress for each of these uh, actors for for uh, which are paid servers or secondaries or geo secondaries and then a decision is made um, to see if they are far behind or not and whether we have to throttle log generation rate on the primary to enable them to be able to catch up in a reasonable amount of time so um, some of the if if a particular component is one gig or more behind then there is no throttling applied if it is greater than one gig of log behind then throttling um, you know base is based on how fast log apply is is being done to these uh, components so there are some heuristics around how far it is behind and what's the catch up rate and based on that we will throttle your log generation rate and so here are some weight types with regards to log itself um, that exist on hyperscale uh, there's the log rate governor and that exists on not only hyperscale but other tiers of uh, Azure SQL DB and that effectively says that how much you're generating on the compute node on your right um, replica is beyond whatever the limit is for the tier for hyperscale it's 100 Mbps and then there are these set of RBIO weights and the RBIO weights are unique to hyperscale and these tell you what other types of components are the reason for your log generation rate being throttled. So RBIO RG storage means paid servers are behind in an application of this log. RBIO RG destage is um, you know, throttling due to destaging of the log to blob. Um, and RGIO RG replica is because the replica, secondary replicas, if you have read replicas, uh, they are behind an application of this log. So these are kind of the weights which are unique. So any of these weights appearing in your weight stats analysis means there are some hyperscale components behind the scenes which are behind in application of the log. So having said that, let's look at a um, log generation, log latency demo with hyperscale for this demo I'm using Databricks and a spark spark notebook so all this code here is just to read from uh, some files from a data lake and if we look at this um, records there are 33 million rows going to be inserted so the first step is I'm going to start a bulk insert and for the bulk insert, um, you know, effectively just two things are true. I am using tab lock here uh, to allow parallel uh, bulk inserts and I'm using a batch size of 100,000. Uh, if we actually come back to hyperscale, um, one of the things we, uh, we can do for a particular tier using this DMDB um, resource governance is see what the maximum log generation limit is for a particular tier and so here you see this is just over 100 mbps for hyperscale but might be different depending on a tier next we look at resource stats and resource stats gives you a, a percentage of of your cap that is being hit we see that we are almost at 90 percent uh, of log generation limit if we get the requests that are actually uh, executing right now um, we will see at some point yeah we will see at some point that this log generation is throttled you see this log rate governor and all these bulk inserts are actually waiting on log rate governor which means you've hit your limit of log generation rate 
um, right? So the other way is you can get weight stats delta between, uh, so this is DM OS weight stats. I just put it in a stored procedure so that we can calculate deltas between, um, you know, snapshots. And we'll see one of the primary, um, you know, weights is log rate governor. Uh, and we see that there are 44,000 tasks waiting and there's a, you know, bunch of wait time spent in that, um, right? So that's hitting log generation uh, limit. From a latency perspective, uh, we can look at the latency of uh, the file ID 2, which is your log file from DMIO virtual file stats. So let's look at that um, real quick. And uh, you will see this, this is just like DMOS wait stats. One snapshot doesn't give you a whole lot because it is since server restart. So this has you know the number of reads, number of bytes read, and then you'll have number of writes and number of bytes written. So taking two snapshots of that will give you latency, uh, right? So uh, this is finished. The 33 million rows has actually finished in 1.8 minutes. And so I am going to actually start the bulk load into a column store table, and I'll, I'll explain why uh, in a second. So I, I run this uh, bulk load into a column st uh, store table. And we'll try to look at log latency actually across two snapshots. So I do a get file stats again. And that takes the delta between the prior snapshot and this snapshot. And so if we zoom in only into the file ID 2, which is this one, uh, we'll see the number of writes, the number of writes, um, you know, uh, number of writes and number of uh, bytes written and then you'll see this is around five milliseconds um, is the latency of log writes and we're writing quite a bit at this point of time um, right so uh, let's go back to uh, you know the the load and see if that's that's finished that's still going on uh, if you look at requests now uh, go back to requests we are not going to see log generation, um, log rate governor anymore, even if I run this a couple times. And um, part of the reason is because we are doing a load into a column store and into compressed row groups directly. So if, if we take a look at my load statement, I've used a batch size here of a million, which means that... Um, you know, if the batch size into a column store of a load into a column store table is more than 102,000, it goes directly into compressed row groups. What this means is before the write is actually done to the log, the row group is compressed. So how much you're writing to the log is fundamentally, you know, less. And we'll see these same 33 million rows took less time. It was 1.9 minutes. It's 1.32 minutes uh, with column store. More importantly, uh, here's a Grafana dashboard based on, um, you know, the Telegraph plugin. I'm just going to zoom into the last five minutes. And uh, if if we actually look at the log bytes flushed per second, and this is a Perfmon counter, this was with the heap, which was hitting throttling because we were close to the 100 Mbps mark or at 100 Mbps mark. Because we are loading into clustered column store, we are loading significantly less to the log. Um, we are closer to the 50 Mbps uh, mark, right? Log generation rate is a um, is a commodity on on the Azure side. So if you're hitting log generation rate, things like compression do help even on the right side of the equation. Um, going back to um, uh, files uh, to to the column store table, we'll see that all these all these row groups have been compressed directly they're not going to the delta store and so amount of log generated is much less not last but not the least if you don't happen to capture um, you know the usage resource stats because uh, you know you can always look at the historical views there are two historical views uh, dm resource governor workload history ex and pools ex and uh, you know one gives you for the workload group one for the pool and gives you a bunch of things like, um, you know, what's the worker count, session count, request count, reads, writes, so on and so forth. So what we are going to specifically look at, because this is log, is, um, you know, there is something called a max log rate KB, delta log bytes used. 
and we are going to calculate the log rate per second from this. So historically also you can look at this uh, historical DMV and see the log rate per second. And as you can see, I mean, right now the ingest is, uh, you know, terminated, but, you know, right here it was around 32 Mbps to 50 Mbps. Um, whereas when it was a heap, this was closer to the 100 Mbps mark. Um, right, so that's data load and, and looking at latency and throughput of your log um, on hyperscale and really on any tier. We looked at the write path now and we are going to move on to the read path. So the first thing we are going to cover is this RBPX cache. And this is a cache that exists, uh, this is the non-covering RBPX cache which exists on your compute replicas. So whether it's primary or read replicas, both have this non-covering cache. So on a standard SQL server, you have the buffer pool, which is memory. And if you're doing a read or write, um, you do an async read or async write into this remote data file control block or FCB, which actually do, does the read file and write file call. Uh, what we do on hyperscale is we intercept this async read or scatter read. Scatter read is effectively if you're reading multiple pages at a time or the corresponding write functions. And we actually plug it into a caching layer. So this RBPX cache is a non-covering cache on local SSD on the compute. The size of this cache is proportional to the memory for the tier. So if you have um, a tier in Azure SQL DB that has uh, you know, 100 gigs of memory, then it is three times that, uh, right? So, so what we do is we have this RBPX metadata that sits on memory optimized tables. Um, so as we are reading, um, a, a particular page, we effectively go to this metadata and we have something called a page table that, that stores what pages of what files are actually cached. So on a read, if that page is not in buffer pool, it will go and check if this page is in RBPX and then it doesn't even have to leave the local compute node to go to the page servers. Uh, right On the right, uh, on the other hand, we'll check this um, page locator free list and see if we have a free page in RBPX and if so, um, you know, we will write. One thing to realize is this is all based on remote buffer pool, exten or buffer pool extensions which was introduced I think in 2012 or 2014. Um, so all of the IOs are 8K IOs, um, you know, because a page in buffer pool is an 8K page. Um, as we talked about, the size is proportional to service objective is 3x the memory, and uh, pages on the uh, on the access of a are not cached on the first touch. So if a page is actually required, it's brought into buffer pool. If the page is touched a few times, three times, then or two two more times, then it is written to um, you know RBPX cache. So pages are invalidated if they're dirty. So if I update a page then that and that page exists in RBPX, then that's uh, invalidated because we don't want a dirty version of page. And the checkpoint process on the compute doesn't actually write any of that data to page servers. It only writes it to RBPX um, and clears the dirty bit. And then this uh, RBPX being a cache, there's LRU or least recently used uh, algorithms which are triggered if the free pages is less than 2%. Um, so we'll free up uh, cache so that we can cache other used, frequently used pages. Then we'll dig into the page server. Um, page server is, is the heart of where your data storage is. This is the second level um, cache. This is a covering cache. So um, the RBPX on compute actually is a non-covering cache. The page server is a covering cache. Uh, this is a stateful service fabric application. It has a replication of a uh, factor of two, which means that each page server has its replica for HA. Uh, and then compute actually uh, talks to these page servers. And when it requests a page, it maintains a quality of service to both the replicas. So they work in more of an active active fashion. Either of them can actually service a request for a page from the compute node. 
Each of these page servers work independently, so each of them have their own file on blob storage. Um, you know, and um, this is covering we talked about. So when we actually work, th this is also RBPX, but it's a covering RBPX, and we cache segments instead of pages because um, all pages are effectively going to be in this RBPX, um, right? So it offloads some of the operations from compute. Um, so things like backups and actual checkpoints happen on the page server, and that frees up some resources on compute. Um, so backups are effectively done with file snapshots, and we'll see a little, uh, you know, later. And uh, the other thing is, so each of these segments of page servers are responsible for this log apply, right? So the request from log for the log service for this chunk of data and apply any changes that the compute has made which have been written to the log service. These storage accounts also provide redundancy. So there's an RAGRS account. One of the page services is an RAGRS account which enables scenarios like geo restore, uh, restore of the database to a different <coughs> region. Now we talked about log apply. And so this log service tiered reads um, fits into that. Um, so when the page server is applying log, it's effectively telling xlog, give me a log block. The xlog um, is, is, has actually multiple tiers like we saw before. We had the log broker, which is only in memory. We had a local SSD cache, then the landing zone and the long-term storage. On the read log part of the equation, as we go down the stack, this is an increasing performance cost. Broker has a few gigs, uh, log cache has hundreds of gigs, um, landing zone is one terabyte, and then long-term storage could have up to seven or soon to be 35 days, depending on your retention configured. Uh, right, so when we request the log, you, you know, we go to the broker, and if it's latest log we're requesting, a page server is not behind in log apply uh, for a lot, then we'll get that service really quickly from a hash map, which is in memory, uh, and the page server then can apply that log. But just remember, when we talked about kind of throttling, um, there are scenarios if a page server is behind, it may require a log from a lower tier, and the lower tier that it requires, the more the performance implications in terms of a time to retrieve that log and apply that log. But in most stable state, uh, in, in any stable state system, you're going to get most of the log from the broker, so that's going to be extremely fast. Now, looking at the page read life cycle, um, so you have files on blob storage. The only time you actually read from this blob storage is if we have to provision a new page server and or if... Um, you know, the page server node unexpectedly fails and so has to seed from Azure, um, you know, storage. But uh, remember, the page server has a replica. So if any one of them is up, it's still servicing requests uh, while the other one is seeding. While it is seeding, a request from that page server could be slower, right? And then you have primary or secondary compute nodes which actually interact with this page server. So when a user requests a read, uh, you know, first thing is if it's in buffer pool, uh, you know, if, if it's in buffer pool, there's no I.O., it's in memory, all, everything is good. If the page is not in buffer pool, first it will look and see if it's in the RBPX. If it's in the RBPX, then it's local SSD cache, it's returned quickly, um, you know, all is good. If it is not in the RBPX, then it's an RBPX cache miss, and we issue something called a get page at LSN. So we are requesting, we know what page server that page resides on because, uh, you know, of the request of the page. So we request that page server, give me this page at a particular LSN. And why is that? So because we know what LSN we need to read it at, right? And so... If the page server already is caught up to that LSN, the page is returned, um, all is good. If the page server is not caught up to that LSN, because remember the uh, page servers apply log asynchronously, then the page server requests for that log block to catch up to that LSN from the log service and then returns the page to compute. So it, it really is a multi-tier caching and performance uh, implications depend on kind of which layer of cache you're hitting. 
um, all your super hot case uh, pages should be in memory in buffer pool most of your warm or hot pages should be in rbpx um, and then if you're doing reads outside of that goes to a page server so um, you know from a compute perspective in troubleshooting you'll see page io latch and there's no distinction at this point of page io latches because we're reading from rbpx or um, you know page server but there are diagnostics um, in in other spheres if you will so from an io accounting we talked about log now this is data uh, we've talked about virtual file stats and seen already um, Virtual file stats is a file ID zero, which represents RBPX IO. As we talked, all of that is 8KB. There is also a perfmon counter for cache hit ratio of RBPX, so you can see usage. When is RBPX important? So today, if you actually, um, you know, scale up or scale down compute, you lose your non-covering cache, um, right? So you can see how much of your reads are coming from cache versus remote um, reads. Um, so, so there is also governance in the data IO percentage in the portal as well as in uh, DM IO, uh, DMDB resource stats um, is governed. So uh, how do you know if it's being governed? Virtual uh, file stats has this IO stall queued read and write milliseconds, which will tell you that. Uh, the other thing we've added in about every other place that you have uh, any tracking from a queries perspective is we've added these uh, paid server reads because it's very important from a hyperscale perspective to know what is a local read versus remote read because remote read is a little more expensive than a local read. So DM exec requests, all the query stats uh, related DMVs, and then query store related, um, you know, catalog views have paid server reads. So you can track kind of, is a query slow because it's doing a lot of reads overall, or is it, is it because it's doing a lot of uh, remote reads versus local reads, uh, right? Paid server reads are also added to actual uh, execution plans, and we talked about query store already. So let's look at a page server reads and some of the other DMVs for um, the read side of latency. So when talking about page servers, currently there is a one is to one mapping of what is a file on the database versus what is a page server. So the easiest way to know how many page servers uh, you have is to look at sys.database files. And as you can see, I mean, there are a bunch of database files, each of 128 gig in size, and these are filled up um, at this point, right? So we also talked about throttling, and throttling can actually affect reads because um, a page server, this is an indirect way actually to, to see if some actor or page server is behind. Some of the weights to do with throttling, as we had talked about, are RBIO, RG storage, D stage, replica, so on and so forth. So what about RBPX? RBPX effectively is file ID zero. Um, so virtual file stats has a database ID and file ID of zero. So you can track performance of RBPX in that. Currently, there are no reads or writes or stalled uh, reads at all. Um, but the way to do that is actually to look at differences. So let's just run, um, you know, one, uh, you know, run of the get file stats difference and, and then look at a difference uh, again in a second. So um, these reads and writes are also in your plan or in, uh, you know, in, in IO stats. So if you st uh, set statistics IO on and run a particular query, uh, which actually is in, I'm in the wrong database, so let me just switch to the right database. Um, uh, we should be able to, and I'll enable uh, actual execution plan as well. Uh, in this first run of the query, we see effectively that uh, logical reads are, uh, are there, but there are no page server reads or, or page server read, ahead, read aheads. So this data is coming from either buffer pool or RBPX. If I change uh, this ID um, and run this again, we will see a different um, result. And this is because this is non-cached data. So here I'm seeing, um, 
you know, paid server reads and paid server read aheads um, actually show up as non-zero. Looking at the plan as well, um, I can look at properties of the plan and let me maximize this in a second. Um, and, and look at the clustered index uh, scan here. And in IO statistics, I am going to see paid server reader heads here um, and paid server reads if there are reads, right? So the difference is reads or reader heads. But you will see that in your actual plan as well. Uh, these columns are also in your um, cache, um, whether it's query stats or, or any of the other, other DMVs, you will see uh, page server reads show up there as well. Um, and last but not the least, um, if we go to query store, I don't have procedures here, so I'm just going to switch my database again um, to a different database. In query store also, we will have kind of the queries, and, and if we look at the top ones, actually, in this case, the top ones are statistics updates. Statman queries are statistics updates, which have... Uh, paid server IO reads. So, so though that indicates, I mean, so file ID 0 in RBPX is, um, so file ID 0 in virtual file stats is RBPX, and all these other DMVs have a gist of um, what IO is. So, I just started a workload to show you what file stats would look like, or virtual file stats would look like as a difference. And if we take two snapshots of virtual file stats, we will see each of these files with a latency number. So you see that database ID, uh, file ID 3 to 10 has done some IO, some reads, and here's your latency of the reads. Whereas none of these reads have actually come from RBPX during this point of time. Next, let's look at some scaling benefits due to replicas. So Hyperscale has the concept of read replicas and, and we support up to four. The way you connect is with application intent equal to read only and that will direct those queries under the connection string to the read replicas. Read replicas talk to the same set of page servers so they don't have their own copy of storage by any means and to the same log servers. They just have their own caching layers, whether it's buffer pool or RBPX. Um, replicas are also hot failover targets today. So you have a higher SLA if you have greater than zero replicas. Replicas are also priced uh, with Azure hybrid benefits. So that's around a 30% discount. And then uh, replicas apply log a little differently than do paid servers. So log is applied and, and redone, redo is done only if a page is in buffer pool or its local IPPX cache. If it's not, all the log is not sent to replicas because only log needs to be sent uh, for those pages that are actually being serviced uh, or are servicing the read requests that come to those replicas. Um, so there's no direct connection from primary to secondary. Right, so there's no uh, copy and then RBPX caching is specific to the workload run on the replica. So it doesn't share the same cache because each replica could have a different set of hot pages. Uh, one thing to realize is MaxDOP can be set uh, separately for primary and for read replicas. And there is a database scoped option that enables you to do that. So because some, sometimes the characteristics of what is uh, the workload running on primary is fundamentally different than um, your replicas. Uh, and then we can have today up to four replicas, but we'll see in futures that's going to change. So let's look at scaling reads with hyperscale, um, you know, using read replicas to scale workloads. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you this database. This is an ATV core database. And what we're going to do as we start our demo, because it'll take a minute and a half or so to add these replicas, is we're going to go ahead and add two replicas and click um, apply so that while we run the remainder of the demo, these replicas will be created. So I click apply and then I move to my and I move to my workload and actually start this workload. So I have um, I'm going to show you this workload, but I have a workload 
uh, I'm going to just click start and then come uh, you know back to it. So I have a read write workload here. I have two groups of workloads. I have a read write group and a read only group. Uh, the read write group has 40 threads. The read only group has um, you know 80 threads. Um, and so right now because there are no replicas, they're still being added. Everything is going to the primary. And uh, two numbers to note, we see around, um, you know, 1900 or so transactions a second on the read replica and um, of the read workload rather. And we see around 1251 um, transactions per second for the write workload, um, right? So that's my, it's all going to primary right now. And I can prove it by going to my telegraph dashboard and refreshing and um, as you can see here we are kind of pegged on CPU uh, so CPU is almost at a hundred percent and then you see we had about 5,000 requests per second um, you know batch requests per second overall that's across reads and writes and um, if we look at uh, kind of the cumulative wait time okay whatever the wait time is it's page IO latch but a lot of it is due to signal wait time so if you if you see the averages here or the signal wait time you'll see SOS scheduler yield uh, which is indicative of CPU uh, you know be one of the largest weights right so we are pegged on CPU uh, pretty much plateauing almost at 100 um, percent so I am going to go ahead and stop um, you know this workload uh, so if we, if we actually look at um, one more thing I will look at is, is resource stats we see we are pegged at CPU and, uh, you know, we have a ton of requests going on um, right now on this server. Some, some ingest, some selects, uh, a combination thereof. Um, and here we are, you're actually hitting errors because we are out of resources, right? So, um, so let's go back to our dashboard and, and see our, our workload must have stopped. Um, and see, CPU has come down. And if you uh, go and see the replicas have been uh, added. So if you look at this, the replicas have been added in, in less than two minutes, right? Um, so we're going to restart this workload now uh, one more time. Um, and, and this time, this time, since there are read replicas, since we added two replicas, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bump these threads from 80 to 180 because there should be more... Uh, headroom on the read replicas, uh, right? And I'm going to launch um, this workload and I'm going to start it. And uh, it'll take a second uh, to ramp up. It, while it ramps up, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually connect to this database, uh, file new database engine query, um, and go to application intent equal to read only. So I'm going to go to HS cdb4tb uh, and application intent equal to read only. So I'm connecting to the replica by doing that. And if I look at the replica, now I see CPU is actually being generated on the replica, uh, right? And I see requests actually on the replica. Uh, a quick way to show you that this host name was db22. Uh, of the replica, if we came to the primary, um, the host name was, um, you know, DB30. So we know we are on actually different, um, you know, nodes. Um, and, and so, so what happens to our numbers? Um, if we go to our numbers um, that we had seen, we were seeing about 1900. It's almost, it's doubled, more than doubled. The read um, transactions per second has doubled. And then there is more headroom on the primary, um, and so those went from 1250 uh, transactions a second to 2500 transactions a second. Though I have not changed the number of threads, it's just the latency of each transaction is reduced because we are not uh, bound on CPU. Uh, last but not the least, if you come to back to the dashboard, um, you know CPU utilization has reduced from 100% to 40% on that primary. Um, and, and we are doing more batch requests for just the ingest than we were before. So that's uh, scaling with uh, read replicas. It's uh, super simple. It was two minutes to add to ATV core uh, replicas and scale out our workloads. Next, we're going to look at hyperscale backup and restore. 
Um, as we said, backup has no impact to um, the compute node itself because backup is taken via snapshots. So every n number of minutes, we generate snapshots from individual files um, corresponding to the page servers, and those snapshots are not synchronized across files. On page servers, I/O is frozen, and a snapshot is taken. Um, right. So if we want to do a point in time restore to a particular time, the first thing that's done is the latest snapshot is actually uh, considered for each file. So in this case, it would be this one, this one, this one, um, and then. Uh, at the start of the oldest transaction um, with regards to the snapshot, with accelerated database recovery in mind, which makes recovery super fast, um, the area, the active area of the log is then copied um, to a new storage account. So new storage accounts are provisioned because the point in time restore is going to be a fundamentally different or new database. Um, and then those snapshots are copied over and the log corresponding to the uh, oldest transaction is copied over. Then we spin up compute um, and attach to those files on Azure storage. Um, and then the log service seeds whatever was in the landing zone corresponding to those active transactions. And last but not the least, compute is spun up for uh, the primary and replicas configured and your database uh, is online once recovery is done. Again, with ADR, recovery is a matter of seconds. This is no longer, uh, you know, a long uh, operation. Even if you had, uh, you know, a transaction, a large transaction, uh, which had not rolled back. So this is a constant time recovery because these snapshots are almost instantaneously. You restore from snapshots almost um, instantaneously. Um, and this is not a size of data. So you should be able to do a 10 terabyte or 15 terabyte within 20 minutes, um, you know, restore. So that's uh, backup and restore in a nutshell. Uh, next, we'll move to performance tips. Uh, and performance tips are really, I mean, some of them are hyperscale specific, but not really. Um, all the, C it's just SQL Server at the end of the day. SQL Server, um, you know, common best practices apply, so I'm not going to go through all of those. A uh, couple specific things to Azure and to hyperscale. Uh, TempDB and RBPX are a finite resource uh, because it's on the local SSD of the compute node. The size of, uh, is proportion of RBPX, as we talked, is proportional to the compute size or number of cores for the service objective that your uh, database is on. A uh, couple tips with regards to maintenance, um, you know, uh, given, given uh, you know, index builds can be a long operation, try to use resumable indexes to create or rebuild indexes when possible. That will give you the pause resume functionality um, as well as it will not consume as much, uh, you know, log. Uh, if you're doing offline index builds, offline index builds are still the fastest in some of the truncate and load and, and the quickest way to get an index, um, you know, if you don't have concurrent workload going on. Um, use max stop hint, um, you know, 8 to 16. 8 is a good start um, because beyond that point, A, you're either maximizing log generation rate or uh, you will run into latch contention um, between the threads. Um, for tempdb, and this is a, a factor of size because you can have large databases in, in hyperscale. While we have great defaults for number of files on tempdb, certain workloads can still run into um, GAM, SCAM, or, or system table contention in tempdb. Uh, we don't support memory optimized durable tables or, or non-durable tables, but we do support memory optimized table variables. And that helps alleviate tempdb contention uh, if that exists. Um, then we talked about log generation rate quite a, a bit. 100 Mbps is the limit. Um, and uh, if you're doing a POC, don't think that because the limit is 100 Mbps that you will be able to hit it if you're on two cores or four cores, because more than likely in that case, you will run into CPU bottlenecks. And then log generation limit uh, you know, or rate is a commodity on Azure, so data compression does help with its uh, ETL uh, into column store, so on. 
Scale up, scale down to scale out reads we've seen. It's a 60 to 90 seconds irrespective of data size. So it's a great way to segregate or scale out um, your read workload. And then some operations, while we say most operations are size of data, some operations are not. Um, things like cross-region copies are not size of data. Things like geo-restores um, are not um, you know, size of data because um, you, you know, cross-region copies are um, a copy of the full database. Within region, we can do things from snapshot. Cross-region, we can't necessarily. So it's uh, proportional to size of data. Um, and then there are some monitoring uh, with Telegraph blog, um, which has a repo, and this helps kind of get some more granular monitoring, those dashboards that I showed you earlier. Migration cons considerations. If you're migrating from on-prem today, we don't have backup restore as a mechanism for migration. So it's a logical data migration into hyperscale on, or, or into any single database, uh, you know, Azure single database, if you will. Um, so logical uh, data migration is necessary. Um, that includes bulk copy or uh, with ADF or Spark or BCP or, or using this smart bulk copy, which is a sample.net application. The other way is snapshot rep replication. Um, if you're using snapshot replication, use concurrent, uh, you know, snapshots. Just note that uh, replication does have some limitations in terms of your tables having primary keys and such. Migration from other tiers is um, just a service tier change. It's an online um, operation. Uh, what we would recommend is consider doing this at a period where your write workload is minimal because the way we do it is we stand up almost a temporary instance uh, behind the scenes and the files, um, you know, so if you have a lot of log generation rate, it has to actually catch up uh, before the cutover and um, that can be tough um, given that the files are on Azure storage. So. So uh, do that during a uh, lower period of rights. Currently, you don't have a, a way to go back to the prior, uh, prior, uh, prior tier. So it's a one-way migration. But you can restore to a point of time um, you know, before the migration within the retention period. We'll see futures where we are closing that gap. And then source uh, size uh, considerations. There are certain types of, of very small type of workloads. If you're uh, migrating from an existing tier and your current files in system database files are already greater than 128 gig, uh, we land you on a one terabyte paid server, which has a one terabyte blob that backs it up. And in uh, some workloads that have many small, tiny writes, uh, you can hit and, and write to kind of the end of... Um, a file because your clustered index is in an ascending key, for example, you might hit, um, you, you know, some contention because one terabyte blobs do tend to throttle um, on the Azure storage size. So our new uh, databases all have 128 gigs. If you already were on a size greater than that, um, you know, you may run into this if you have some, um, you know, edge case workloads with tiny writes. We are working to architecturally address this in the next few, um, you know, few months and, and have a logical separation between what compute sees as a file and the database sees as a file. Uh, last but not the least, let's go to some uh, innovation and futures. Uh, we just announced reserved capacity or reserved instances uh, that's GA'd in October. That is more of a price optimization thing where you can reserve capacity and get discounts for that. Uh, we have TD BYOK or Bring Your Own Key, which is in public preview, and we should be GAing this soon. Um, this will enable the customer to get your own managed keys for TD. Uh, database copy for hyperscale is in public preview. Within region, uh, you have really fast uh, copies because they're from snapshots. Across region, they are more size of data operations. Um, currently, point-in-time restore is limited to seven days. We will have the ability to go up to 35 days, which is more of a parity um, with other tiers in hyperscale. So we are closing whatever gaps exist in terms of parity with other tiers. Um, we have geo-replication, which will enable um, 
uh, replication of a hyperscale database from one region to another that will be coming um, shortly. I don't have exact dates to announce, but it is in the very near future. And there's ongoing work to close both the feature ca uh, parity gap and uh, make fundamental improvements in scalability on, on hyperscale. And you will see that the great part of having um, uh, you know, a service is you don't have to necessarily do the upgrades as as these are released, you will have immediate benefit of seeing that at play. Uh, last but not the least, here's some documentation and resources on, on hyperscale. Um, you know, I'm happy uh, to hear feedback or answer questions. I hope you have, uh, you know, a great, um, you know, conference. Um, don't remember to, um, you know, fill out your evaluations. Um, and again, wish you a great remainder of the conference.